good morning, good afternoon, or almost good night to those who attend this session. My name is Wolfgang Britz. I'm working with the University of Bonn. I have the pleasure to host this session um, as part of the 24th annual conference titled Global Food Systems Opportunities and Challenges. Our session is titled Climate Change, and um, it's a pleasure to welcome Maxim Chepelyev from the GTAP Center, who is our host, and um, will make sure that everything works smoothly from the technical side. Most of you will know Maxim from its work on the GTAP database and model. Um, we have a session with four papers, um, as you see from the, from the slide. So each presenter has 20 minutes, followed up by 10 minutes of discussion. Um, and I think we have a very nice selection of papers, which we are going to look at. The first two papers look at different aspects of integrating emission trading schemes. Uh, the presenters are Jui Wang and Malte Winter, respectively. Jui is from the New Zealand Forest Research Institute, and Malte is with the Kiel Institute of the World Economy in Germany. Um, next. Henry Chen um, from the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Pol Policy of Global Change will share its insight on with us how to depict climate-related financial risk in CGE modeling. And then finally, we hand over to Dominic <laughs> van der Mensbrückel, known to all of us, I guess. He is the director of the GTAP Center, and he will enlighten us how to turn a CGE into an integrated assessment model, which incorporates marginal emission curves for climate relevant gases as well as to depict feedback from climate on productivity. Um, for the presenters, Maxim will alert you two minutes uh, before your speech has to end. And once these two minutes are over, I will start with the discussions. To all of us, before we start, a few commonly applied rules across this conference to facilitate our sessions. Um, please mute your mic when you are not speaking. And if you want to ask a question, then please edit it in the chat function, address, addressing the question to all so that everybody can read what you would like to ask. Um, and questions will be taken in the order they are received via the chat function. Um, you can add questions already during the presentation, which we then can pick up in the discussion. Okay, so that was the more general introduction. So I've, it's now a special pleasure to welcome as the first presenter this year's winners of the Wallace E. Tena Award, Mrs. Chui Wang. And she's going to present her paper, Impacts of China's Emission Trading Scheme on the National and Hong Kong economies, a dynamic computable general equilibrium analysis. This paper is co-authored with Neven Winchester, Christopher Webster, and Kion Min Man. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. So uh, first of all, let me share my content. Um, okay, here we go, share. Um, so can anyone see my screen? All good? Perfect. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm very um, glad to meet you all. Um, so my name is Yue Wang. I'm an economist working for New Zealand Forestry Research Institute, which has another name, Sayang, uh, in New Zealand. So here um, we are 10 p.m. now. Um, so uh, I'm very glad to uh, share one of our researches uh, collaborating with the University of Hong Kong with you. So uh, the topic is about impacts of China's emissions trading scheme on the national and Hong Kong economy uh, in terms of a dynamic CG analysis. Um, so I'm going to um, so I'm going to uh, introduce the background and the research questions first, and then followed by uh, the main method and data and also the key findings we uh, found, and then uh, I'll share some policy implications. So here uh, in our research area, we focused on mainland China and um, Hong Kong, which is a special administrative region of China, uh, both economies, um, 
can you say the next slides? Wait. All good? Okay, so sorry, because I couldn't see my slides here. Um, okay, just sorry, just give me one minute. I think my computer just died now. Okay, cool. All good? Oh, perfect. So uh, both economies share similar emissions profile, but uh, different in magnitude. So as you can see from this slide, this is uh, the emissions profile from mainland China, and where we can see electricity contributes the largest and followed by industry and the transport. Uh, similarly, Hong Kong uh, also consumes a lot of electricity, which commits more, but followed by transport and industry. So how, what, what, what kind of efforts do the both economies do? Well, from national's perspective, uh, the national government commit to the international society that they will reduce up to 65% of carbon intensity by 2030. And earlier this year, they promised to be carbon neutral by 2060. The Hong Kong also made the pledge, uh, which is stricter to, um, you know, compared to mainland China, uh, because Hong Kong's pledge is based on absolute reduction, which is not depending on the growth uh, in GDP. So here we want to ask two research questions. Um, sorry, like my slides cannot move now. Okay, so we want, uh, sorry, uh, so, uh, so in mainland China, uh, there were eight pilot carbon markets operating from 2013 to 2016. Um, and in the late of 2017, uh, we launched national ETS, but because it's quite challenged to merge the different regional uh, carbon markets together. So up to uh, earlier this year, this national ETS was in force. Well, uh, within the ETS, the only regulated sector is power, which includes com combined heat and power, uh, as well as the other power plants of the other sectors who has the uh, capacity of more than 26,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, Hong Kong does not have any ETS at the moment. Uh, however, the local government seeks actively, you know, across border with mainland China to the mitigation opportunity. So we wanted to ask two questions. The first one is, um, what is China's national mitigation target mean to both mainland China and Hong Kong economy? And also we wanted to know what if Hong Kong is fully integrated into the national ETS? So what, what does that mean? to um, the mitigation cost and what is the distribution impact. So we uh, developed a dynamic GTAP model, sorry, CGE model in terms of the GTAP 9 power data. Uh, and also we use external sources for uh, the national emission data like make, gains, and IEA. Uh, and also we collect the data from the local Environmental Bureau of Hong Kong. The model runs from 2011 to 2030. Uh, the model is a dynamic. Uh, well, it includes six regions as shown here and also 16 sectors. So here we have um, four uh, fossil fuel energy sectors, which is from COA to gas, and also we have eight renewable in, uh, electricity sectors, as you can see here. We designed five scenarios. So first one is the business as usual, uh, where no policy inter interruption. And then we, um, based on Paris Agreement and the IPCC target, we set up four scenarios. So Paris and the IPCC uh, means both markets are independent, independently, but the Paris underscore int and the IPCC underscore int means both economies are integrated together. Uh, so we wanted to compare compare the impacts, you know, under each scenario. So I selected some key results from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the model results. Uh, first one is about change in GDP, uh, as we can see here. So, as I said before, like Paris means uh, independent carbon market um, under Paris Agreement. 
uh, and Paris underscore int, which means the uh, integrated market. And we can see that there's not a big change to mainland China. However, Hong Kong's economy is much more sensitive, uh, you know, with and without link, linking to the, uh, the national ETS. Uh, and also we can see here under the IPCC, which is stricter target. So similarly, mainland, mainland China doesn't affect too much, but Hong Kong uh, suffers more. Uh, this is because we have more, you know, stricter uh, carbon target, uh, carbon mit uh, mitigation target. So which means carbon mitigation cost is higher. And also we can see similar trend to the carbon price. So if uh, if we look at China, uh, mainland China's market, the carbon price is not changing a lot. Well, I, I have to say it's kind of similar by 2030. So here, uh, the carbon price could be reached to 67 um, US dollars per ton of CO2, but Hong Kong suffers more if they, you know, at their own. So under Paris Agreement, they can be reaching to 700, but if they link to the national market, the price would be uh, reduced sharply, similarly to the IPCC uh, commitment. And also we can look at the energy mix, uh, you know, under different scenarios. So here we have six graphs. The top three illustrates the uh, change in energy mix for mainland China under BAU and Paris and Paris integrated. And the lower three uh, describes Hong Kong's situation and uh, uh, business as usual under Paris and also under IPCC. So if we, you know, we don't have any carbon mitigation target, so both of both economies just use a lot of coal. So here you can see a downturn here. This is because uh, we assumed there is a large drop in Hong Kong's GDP due to COVID. So from 2020 to 2021, here is a drop. But after 2021, um, without any policy inter, inter, interruption, uh, the use of thermal will go on. However, if we have the Paris Agreement, so we can see in mainland China, uh, use of thermal is slightly declines, but uh, Hong Kong is more sensitive. So we can see a sharp decrease in thermal use and also natu uh, natural gas use. And also, uh, if we look at the energy use uh, under IPCC target, it's quite similar, but the magnitude is sharper. Uh, this is because IPCC sets, you know, harder target for both economies. Um, so regarding to the carbon mitigation, here we uh, compared uh, electricity sector and other industries. The reason is, uh, first of all, electricity is the uh, largest contributor for both economies. And secondly, um, electricity is the only regulated sector for now under the Chinese ETS. So we can see if we uh, let the, you know, as time goes by um, at 2030, so electricity in mainland China and Hong Kong will face the, the, the huge stress uh, for the carbon mitigation task. However, if we link the two markets together, so the other industries would be, uh, you know, trading off uh, with electricity sector by buying, uh, buying and selling carbon credits. So uh, they will share some burden from the uh, electricity sector. And uh, similarly to IPCC, um, so here uh, in the BAU business as usual for both mainland China and Hong Kong, electricity still suffers more. Uh, however, because we set a harder target here, so um, we allow um, you know the treat uh, the trade off between other industries and electricity. But similarly, um, integrating with Chinese market, which is benefit to Hong Kong's economy. So here we can simply conclude that uh, Hong Kong's participation in China's national ETS will be definitely beneficial to Hong Kong uh, without burdening the national economy, but it doesn't affect um, Chinese uh, economy a lot. Uh, however, if Hong Kong wants to be you know, reaching to its target, so it still needs to be more actively in seeking for the collaboration with mainland China. Uh, so that is all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions?
I hope I'm still in my time within 20 minutes. You, you, you're doing perfectly. We, you are even a, a little bit ahead of time, so we have uh, ample possibilities to discuss. And I would remind everybody again, please type in your questions to Joe and her co-authors into the chat, addressing them to all, and Maxime will then forward them to Joe. Um, I'm trying to look at the the chat. Um, sorry, I'm so far still... nothing. Then um, okay. uh, before others start, then Jue, one question from my side. I mean, it, you you have a dynamic model. So what what are the main dynamic elements there, which make 2030 different from 2011? Um, so we use the, the GitHub 9 model. Uh, so for the dynamic part is about the change in GDP uh, and also the change in emission profiles by sectors, by region. Okay. Yeah. So this where, so I'm, I'm still, okay. Oh. Okay. Um, let me find the chat first. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. I'm not quite familiar with the WebEx. But uh, Maxime can also, or I can also mm. read this. Yeah. So yeah. this uh, is this is from Mike Byrne. Um, thanks, Chewie. Very interesting indeed. Could you say a bit more about the electricity sector in the model? What renewable energy sources and other innovation does it incorporate? Thanks. Okay. Um, so the electricity sector in our model is the main focus of the sector. Um, so we assumed there is the uh, substitution between the power generation. So we have uh, four uh, fossil fuel based electricity sector, as you can see here, uh, which is based by coal, crude oil, uh, and a refinery oil and a natural gas. And also we have eight uh, renewable generation for the electricity. Uh, so all the data is from GitHub 9 power. Um, so uh, when we when we simulate the scenarios, we could see uh, the substitution between uh, each uh, fuel um, in the electricity uh, generation uh, yeah, um, in the in the dynamic process. Uh, so we can we can see that um, you know like by if we have harder uh, mitigation target, then. Uh, both economies will uh, implement more use of the renewable energies and uh, reduce the fossil fuel use, um, but with different magnitude. This is Maxim. Maybe I can quickly ask a question. Um, so uh, Hong Kong is is a large exporter, so I assume there should be a lot of emissions connected with uh, international marine bunkers and aviation bunkers which would represent like a large share of, of emissions, depending how you treat it. So my question is, how, uh, how did you approach this, this point? Um, so we didn't model specified at the exported goods with emissions. So we're, we're more uh, focused on the production side because we, uh, we assume the carbon credit as the production input, um, you know, and also can be sold and bought um, you know between sectors so we didn't look at export especially for marine we didn't look at that uh further but we, we definitely we can think about that yeah okay thanks thank you further questions to uh to we Perhaps also the other presenters who work on similar topics um they could perhaps already basically look ahead and uh, ask questions which perhaps help us to understand differences in the models used in this session. Yeah. Somebody wants to step forward here. Should I stop my sharing now? No, no, fine, fine, it's fine. Okay. We, we have still ample time basically to discuss. So, Joe, another one for me. I mean, the uh, at least here in Germany, we have also seen that the 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 emission profile of a certain technology is changing over time. So let's say a an, an, an coal-fired electricity plant of 20 years ago is different from what is today operating in the grid. Is that somehow built into your baseline construction? Um, right. I think um, we, 
we we don't have that uh, specific, uh, you know, focus on on that part because we assumed some fixed factor in the uh, you know in the energy uh, consumption in electricity. So yeah, actually that's what we're we're thinking to um, you know to specify the energy use uh, you know by by year. So we can consider that definitely. Yeah. Um, so and also. Yeah, so this one is published in uh, Frontiers in, in Environmental Science. So if anyone has interest in the details of the model and the results, uh, you can just search the, uh, the the title of the of the paper, and then you can you can find the you know uh, the paper. Have a look. Wolfgang is Dominique, if I can. Sorry, uh, Dominic. Yes. Yeah, no, I, it, it's a really aggregate model. Um, so I would, if I were you, I, I would consider kind of unpacking, especially the, the energy intensive manufacturing sectors. Because mm -hmm. that, that, that I'm sure that the, the national authorities are gonna be really concerned about what happens in some of the more energy intensive sectors. Um, and as a corollary to that, you may, may want to look at leakage impacts of what's happening in the rest of the world when, when China acts alone. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if China's at all thinking about uh, countervailing policies such as a, a, a carbon border adjustment uh, if mm -hmm. it does go alone. So, you know, this, this is really a great start, but I, I think there are a lot of other issues that would be, be of interest uh, as well. Sure, sure, definitely. Um, and also we have another uh, project, which we look at the energy intensive sectors, but that's not for uh, this Hong Kong and the national ETS. We, we're looking at the Belt and the Road. Uh, so between some cities from China and the South, uh, Southeast Asia. So yeah, uh, definitely that's a good uh, suggestion. Thanks, Dominic. Okay, Julie, okay. here's another question by Julio. <clears throat> Punjika Bela, uh, thanks for your um, presentation. Yeah. Maybe I misunderstood, but I'm wondering which is the main channel for which Hong Kong benefits from integration? Um, so, because Hong Kong is a small economy compared with national uh, with the national economy, so um, you know, like with. Um, if we open the market to Hong Kong, then like mainland China is a huge demand uh, for Hong Kong's economy. So from that side, Hong Kong can uh, just reduce its mitigation cost, uh, you know, a lot. So, I mean, that's the one reason. Another reason is uh, due to the one country, two system, you know, politic mechanism. So it's quite hard to operate the integrated system in reality. So from this research, we just gave, you know, uh, like a simulation to say, what if uh, the two markets are together? So, you know, what's the impact to Hong Kong's economy? And we could say the positive things. Um, and also from this, I think the local government can also see the opportunity of uh, collaboration with um, with mainland China, you know, from different province level or regional level. Yeah, that's 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 some insight. Okay, great. Um, we have more questions popping up, which is great. So um, Henry Chen. Says thanks, Chui. It looks like based on the simulation, Hong Kong is harder to decarbonize than China. So I presume, I mean, that relates mostly to this huge differences in carbon prices. So he wonders why. So what is the biggest emission source of Hong Kong, and what explains these differences in the emission prices? If I would perhaps specify this. Okay. Um, so Hong Kong. Um, so the most uh, consumer, or like um, uh, commission, sorry, like uh, emission committer in Hong Kong is from electricity sector, and in Hong Kong we only have two firms uh, operating in the market. So one firm uh, accounts for three uh, out of four, like three quarter of the market share, and another one accounts for one uh, one quarter. So, like they're kind of play with the price. As I said before, uh, if we only have Hong Kong as a standalone economy, then the the I mean the the demand is 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 quite small. But if we open the market, 
then face to you know Chinese huge like enormous enormous amount of the uh, uh, of the demanders, then that part would help Hong Kong to sell the quarters to them. Um, so from that side, that will meet uh, reduce the price um, for Hong Kong. That's my point of view. Hopefully that will answer your question, Henry. Henry. Um, yes, that's you... good. Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, further questions to Julie? Okay, um, I think we don't need to. Um... Okay, I stop sharing. Yeah, then uh, we all thank Jui for her presentation and the insights. Yeah, um, I think it's very nice um, from the flow of presentations that also the second paper um, by Malte Winkler, um, Sonja Pettersen, and Sneha Batra Recha Tube. I hope I got this right. Um, looks as at the consequences of joining ETS. Um, so we are already a little bit in the theme. We have understood that basically it is, these are mostly the differences in the carbon prices which drive this process and the, the uh, advantages and disadvantages of the economies of joining. So that's a very good starting point for Malta's talk titled Gains from Linking the U.S. and Chinese ETS under Different Assumptions or Restrictions, Adjusted Endowments and International Trade. So um, let's turn our attention to Malte, who will, I hope so, also be able to join his presentation with us. Can you see my presentation and can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. Then I will start. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so yeah, you pointed it right. It's uh, actually a very nice fit to what we just heard. So I'm going to talk about the study that we conducted for the uh, Energy Modeling Forum project. And it is funded by the BMBF, the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And with this paper, we try to look into the effects that uh, a linking of the EU and Chinese emission trading systems would have on these two regions. And as you probably know, under the, um, under the Paris Agreement Article 6, it is noted that international cooperation uh, is, is one option to, to jointly reach emission targets. And actually, um, this linking of emission trading systems is one of the mechanisms that is acknowledged to have uh, several uh, positive outcomes. If you link emission trading systems, you increase the liquidity of the carbon market, you de decrease the risk of carbon leakage, and you also show some support for multilateral climate action, which is good. But the most important aspect for this paper I'm presenting today is that it increases the so-called wear flexibility, meaning that it enlarges the room where uh, emissions can be abated, enabling their abation um, where it is cheapest. And at the first glance, actually, this linking of ETS looks like a win-win situation because when you consider two uh, emission trading systems that are going to link, you will always have one partner with higher marginal abatement costs and one partner with lower marginal abatement costs. And the partner with higher costs will become an allowance seller and a uh, allowance buyer, sorry, in the linked system, uh, benefiting from now having to pay lower carbon prices. Well, on the other hand, the region with lower marginal abatement costs uh, will be able to generate revenues from selling allowances to the new trading partner. But of course, in real world, it's not so simple. It's actually very hard to find um, examples for functioning linkages between emission trading systems. And of course, the reasons for that are multiple, but um, the one that I want to focus on here in this paper is that if you consider terms of trade effects, then actually the region that is selling allowances to the new trading partner uh, might face much uh, lower welfare gains or even welfare losses. And why is that? Because after linking, this region will face a higher carbon price than before linking. 
and that can lead to uh, negative competitiveness effects on the global markets, eventually leading to uh, welfare losses. So concerning our example here, the EU and Chinese ETS, um, it must be said that it would be the linkage of these two would be a huge step in the international uh, efforts to price carbon and implement a global pricing system, because these are the two largest emission trading systems in the world. And although at the moment they only cover or mainly cover CO2 from the electricity production and energy intensive industries, this already covers some 20% of the global CO2 emissions. So a linkage of these two would create a massive, uh, huge um, carbon market. And um, in another paper that we also wrote for the same project, we found um, that when, it, when China and the EU link the ETS already about one third of the potential efficiency gains from a global system can be reached. So compared to a global system, even this relatively small co uh, coalition uh, materializes quite a high share of potential efficiency gains. And that is probably also one of the reasons why quite some studies have already looked into this potential linkage. Um, and one key finding is that, as I explained before, it seems like the allowance seller in the region, which uh, in the system, which is um, China in our case, actually um, faces only marginal welfare gains or even uh, negative welfare effects when it links to an emission trading system from Europe. There are also ideas to overcome this problem. One of them would be to restrict the trading volume of allowances, so to not allow full trade from China to, to the EU, but restrict the amount of allowances that can be traded between the two systems. Another approach um, would be transfer payments. In another setting, this has been found to uh, be a suitable tool to counteract indirect market effects resulting from a global emission trading system. And what we want to do with this paper is really uh, to find options for a link between the EU and China, uh, which is equally beneficial to both trading partners. And to do so, um, we deploy our DART model that we have in Kiel here. It's a um, multi-sectoral, multi-regional, because of the model, also based on the GTAP database. So we have a disaggregated electricity sector, as you can see on the very right here. Um, we calibrate our model to meet CO2 emissions and GDP of the world energy outlook. And um, we implement the NDCs as stated in the Paris Agreement. Um, and all world regions uh, should meet the NDCs in our target year 2030. Now, you see an overview of our disaggregation on the right. In red, I mark the regions and or sectors that participate in the emission trading. Uh, so that will be China and um, the EU. You note here that we also disaggregate the EU. I will not go into any uh, details of, of what we found for them, but come back to it in the very end when I come to my conclusions. So keep in mind that we disaggregate the EU. And in terms of um, participating sectors, like I said, this would be mainly electricity production and energy intensive industries. And within this framework, we implement two sets of scenarios, basically, picking up the ideas that I uh, noted before. So the first set would be um, picking up the idea of uh, restricting the traded allowance volume. Here we would now have two extreme uh, cases. On the one hand, we would have a no link scenario where the EU and Chinese uh, systems are not linked. On the other hand, we would have a unrestricted linking scenario where there is full trade of allowances allowed between the two. And in between of these two extremes, there would be, so to say, the shades of gray, instead of shades of gray, where uh, certain shares of allowances can be traded between the two. The second set of scenarios, here we adjust the emission endowments. And we do this in order to mimic these transfer payments that I was talking about. We don't have direct dimension, uh, financial flows in our model, so we kind of use this trick to do it. Um, what we do here is to adjust the emission endowments and to make the uh, emission target of the EU stricter, for example, by 10%, 20%, up to 50%. And at the same time, 
the target in China is made it less strict by the same amount of emissions. So that in total, the combined emissions of the EU and China remain uh, stable, but the shares are different. So the EU has to abate more and China has to abate less. And this we do to mimic these compensation payments. Now let's dive into the results. I start with uh, scenario set one, where we um, restrict the allowance trading. What do we see here? On the x-axis, you have the level to which allowance trading is possible between China and the EU. On each graph, starting on the left, you have the no-link scenario with 0%, and on the very right, there's the other extreme position with uh, unrestricted trading, 100%. And in the middle, for example, here at 50%, this would mean that of the amount of allowances which is traded in the unrestricted trading scenario, 50% can be traded here. So it's just a restriction based on the amount of emissions from the unrestricted trading scenario. And what we see for Europe pretty clearly, when Europe is allowed to buy uh, emission rights from China, it will do so. It will not um, actually decrease its emissions, but emissions in Europe uh, increase quite substantially when it can buy extra allowances from China. Europe benefits from a um, highly uh, strongly decreasing CO2 price. The more and more uh, allowance trading is, is permitted, the lower the price does get for the EU. And we see that also mirrored in the welfare gains of the EU. For them, it is the more trade with China, the better. For China, it looks slightly different. As you see on the welfare graph on the, on the right side, um, China also faces uh, welfare gains at first when it sells allowances at a relatively high price to the EU. But we see this effect reversing when more and more allowances are traded at an uh, increasingly low price. And in addition, with the terms of trade effects that I mentioned before, uh, the, the CO2 price for products in China get more and more expensive. It loses some of its uh, international competitiveness. And therefore, we see here that um, if the uh, volume of traded allowances is higher than 50 percent, uh, the welfare gains in China actually become smaller. Um, so to sum it up, there's quite a different, quite different interests here. China maximizes its welfare at 50 percent of traded allowances, so a, a restriction on the allowance trading and the EU favors unrestricted allowance trading. Now, let's see what the second option holds. Um, this is the adjusted endowment scenarios, as we call it. Um, remember, we do this to mimic transfer payments. And what we do here, I will first explain the graphs again. On the left-hand side of each graph, you see 100%. This would be the standard, the normal NDC target of the two regions. And then as we make the target stricter for the EU, we move from left to right on the graphs uh, up to 150% where the target for the EU would be made stricter by 50%. Uh, so meaning that the EU has to abate 50% more than in the regular case, which is here. At the same time, we reduce um, the target for China by the same amount of emissions so that overall emissions remain the same. And as we saw from the previous set of scenarios, um, China maximizes its benefits when uh, allowance trading is limited to 50%. So we decided to run all these scenarios for two cases, once for unrestricted trading, that would be the solid lines in the graphs, and once for restricted trading, this would be the dashed lines in the graph. And let's look at the EU first again. Um, in terms of emissions, the EU does not actually decrease emissions if full trade with China is allowed. Um, and as it could be understood from the, from the uh, setting of the scenario that actually now the target is stricter, so it has to emit, but no, it does not have to emit. It can simply buy the extra allowances from China. And um, this is also reflected in the welfare. Um, it, it, becomes uh, or the welfare effect for the EU becomes smaller and smaller, the stricter the target gets. Why is that? Because they have to buy more and more extra emissions at a stable price 
from China. So the emission effect, uh, the the, the um, welfare effect becomes smaller for the EU. If we now restrict the trading between China and the EU, we see that there's a quite different picture because now um, the EU actually has to decrease its emissions by half of what it would require from China. This results in an increasing um, CO2 price. And as you see on the right on the welfare uh, graph, uh, quite substantial losses in welfare even. So the welfare is not only smaller compared to the unrestricted trading, but it becomes even negative if the target is uh, stricter, much stricter. For China, it looks different. Again, China benefits more if the um, allowance trading is restricted to 50% than it does for the unrestricted. And this is, of course, what we wanted to, to, to show also um, this transfer payment mechanism. So for the EU, the welfare gains uh, become less and less positive, while for China, it becomes more and more positive. This kind of reflects this idea of uh, transfers from the EU to China. So to sum it up, um, if the traded allowance volume is restricted, then the EU faces a relatively high CO2 price, resulting even in welfare losses in cases. And on the other hand, if um, the traded allowance volume is not restricted, the EU always gains in welfare, regardless of uh, the height of the transfer payments. And China, on the other hand, uh, gains more if the traded allowance volume is restricted. So what does this mean for a research question? Remember that we wanted to outline options that are equally beneficial to both partners. Um, however, we found that in most of our scenarios, uh, the EU benefits more than China. That is what I try to mark blue here. But there are some exceptions where China actually gains more. And that is if the allowance trading is restricted to less than 30% here. And if uh, there's a combination of uh, significant transfer payments and an allowance trading restriction uh, to 50% over here. So generally, China always favors this option where uh, allowance trading is restricted in difference to the EU that always favors the unrestricted allowance trading. And we found that there's also situations possible where uh, the linking is not beneficial to both partners. We have negative welfare effects for the EU in this area here. Um, another important point that I don't, did not cover in this talk due to time restrictions, but I would like to mention it at least. I said in the beginning that we also disaggregated the EU into uh, several regions. And what we found there is that also within the EU, there's differing interests. And why is that? If you imagine, a uh, EU ETS not being linked to China, for example. In this EU ETS, you will also have allowance buyers and allowance sellers. And those regions which are allowance sellers, if the, if the ETS now links to China, they will become allowance buyers because the uh, carbon price in China is much lower than in these regions. So this means that they are not able anymore to generate any revenues from selling allowances within the EU ETF, but now they become allowance buyers and have to pay for their um, emissions. So there's kind of two levels of, um, of uh, political economy problems. So the EU would first have to uh, find mechanisms to create an inner EU consensus for a link with China before it can then, as a EU, uh, try to find consensus with China on how to design the link. And while it is quite obvious that this is probably not a very trivial task, I would like to highlight again that this paper also shows that there are options to make uh, the trading um, of allowances practical and, and, and attractive to both trading partners. And there are definitely options for compromises if you consider these ideas of transfer payments and the combination um, with restricting the allowances. So, and it's given the, the fact that these two emission trading systems are so large and the, the global efficiency gains are so large if they link, it would be worthwhile to consider 
uh, to follow this path and link the two systems. Thank you. Okay. Um... So thanks a lot, Malte, for this quite interesting talk. Uh, talk. Um, it's it's really a very nice compliment to you to his first paper. Um, so far, I see one question here from Henry. Yeah. So, how are emission allowances assigned to each region? This is being done by um, simply by the emission targets. So we put a price on the carbon and um, restrict the emissions, the emission endowment that each region has. And by that, so to say, there's uh, allowances that by setting the endowment. But there's no, we do not implement the question if, if uh, allowances are uh, given for free or if there's auctioning. This is something beyond the scope of this paper. Yeah. Yep. Then, um... David asks, thanks, Malte, very interesting. How will Brexit impact your findings? Uh, good question. Um, it, it, when we started um, finalizing the paper, the Brexit was just happening. So, um, of course, one could run scenarios without the UK being part of the EU ETS. Um, I must honestly say we did not do that. I cannot answer it in terms of uh, numbers that we, uh, that we created with our model, but um, given that the EU is um, one of the larger economies, uh, sorry, that the UK is one of the larger economies of the EU, and it's quite ambitious um, um, emission targets as well, uh, it could be argued that um, maybe the effects will be um, slightly smaller for the EU, if you consider, I mean, if the UK drops out now with its high emission targets, it might mean that um, the the gap between China and the EU in terms of um, in terms of emission targets gets slightly smaller. That would mean that um, the welfare effects for the EU would not be quite so high anymore. But I would, um, yeah, this one would have to model this and, and do a new aggregation to find out what actually happens exactly. Okay. Then the next question is from Matthias Weisel. Thanks, Malte. When trading is restricted. Are there any rents arising? So, um, I mean, there is obviously now scarcity on the uh, quotas you can trade. Yeah, so there is a right to trade. So, how is this handled? Is there what arising? I didn't understand. I mean, you have, if you restrict trade basically, and it would make sense to trade more, then you have basically a rent on that restriction, an economic rent. So, uh, how is this considered? So, how do you how do you determine basically who trades under that uh, restricted allowances scheme? Um, so, what we do is that we um, create, so to say, a shared carbon market, and we only allow uh, for a certain amount of allowances to enter that market, so to say. And who trades is, I mean, that is defined by the max, I guess, that the EU will buy these now uh, cheaper allowances that are part of the shared market from China. Matthias, any follow-up questions on this? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Wolfgang. Um, and thanks, Malta. Uh, well, my question is, basically, if you say, well, the EU can only import a certain amount of uh, cheap Chinese permits, so to speak. Uh, those companies that are able to do this are at an advantage uh, compared to those companies that might not do. So there might be a scarcity of who has the right to buy Chinese permits in the EU. Uh, and of course, that would constitute the rent. But I'm not sure whether you have modeled this in the model, but I think in the real world, this is something um, that would then uh, apply because there's there's a differentiation between the abatement curve uh, costs in or the carbon prices in the EU that still remain, and um, the uh, well price that you can use uh, for uh, yeah for offsetting from China. Thanks. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. thanks so much. We did not uh, implement that into our model. Um, like you said, it depends on the uh, production uh, structures of the sectors or of the firms even. Um, I guess one could do it if one would go into deeper detail, but we did not do it for this study. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. If I, just I if, maybe add on this, sorry. if I if I'm allowed to just uh, yes. die to the Please. round. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, what we did. I mean, in the model, the way we did it, there is just a unique new EU carbon price that's lower than in this scenario without linking. So there's not two prices to different firms. So they all pay the lower price. It's just that there's em emission imports until the the restriction. Is binding and then there is a new unique price. I think we have to check who's actually getting the rents of this scarcity, yeah. and I think it goes to the EU. Um, but yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. But certainly there's not different firms. But that's Matthias, really a good point. We, we should think about it for future work. I mean, as as there is no further question in, we have some time left. I mean, that is perhaps a, a question also. To both presenters, both to Jue and Malte, I mean this question basically: if to whom basically the the income from buying and selling the rents accrues might be also crucial to understand the impacts of integrating such ETS schemes, right? So that has distributional effects also in your economy if if those trends. Are, so are you? Malta, are you working with the um, regional household concept of GTAP, basically, where all income flows to one point and then is distributed to government, private, and saving expenditures? Yeah, yeah. I think that is what we do. So we have a representative agent and we have savings, uh, private and um, uh, public sector. That's right. But um, to be honest, it's a, it's a really good question. One should check who receives it um, in the end. I mean, it goes to the representative agent, if I'm not mistaken, but and where it ends up in the end, that would be interesting and a, uh, and a nice point to pick up. Yeah, thank you. I would have to check. Yeah, because that is basically like an additional endowment for the firm and probably that goes to the capital owners of the firms, right? So that might have distributional consequences depending on how you depict income distribution the model. Jue, perhaps a comment from your side on this, how this is tackled in your model? Uh, well, in our model, uh, we assume the uh, buyers and the sellers are mostly from the producer sector. Uh, so we do have the representative uh, private household for each region. So in our model, I think the uh, there is the trade off uh, between sectors. So if the sector Gains more from the carbon trading than the uh, uh, wage for laborers, you know, will go up. So maybe that's kind of increase the uh, well-being for that household, I guess. Um, yeah. So th that's that's from our model. Okay. Then uh, we have more questions dropping in. So from Julio, thanks for the presentation. Would you recommend carbon taxes for countries willing to link carbon regimes? What can be different under carbon taxes? I mean, if you have carbon taxes, this, um, is, from my understanding, takes away the opportunity to make use of the increased wear flexibility, right? So, I mean, that is one of the advantages of emission trading, really, that you can emit where it is cheapest. Whereas, if you have a price floor or a tax in the extreme case, um, um, the firms will have to abate anyways. Uh, I don't know if you refer to a situation now where a uh, a region that has both a carbon tax and an ETS installed, like for the UK, for example. Um, also there, I would think, I mean, in the case of EU, they benefit from a lower carbon price, right? But if you have a fixed tax on the emissions, this, um, this benefit cannot really be exploited if you say that this is the price floor. So I don't think it makes so much sense. So this, from my understanding, this emission trading really uh, has the big advantage of making um, the, the emitters able to um, use the increased wear flexibility, and I don't see that happen in a, a taxation regime. Okay, thanks, Malte. Then, um, Rafael, thanks, Malte, for the great presentation. 
dass der Inner Trading, yeah, um, as in the EU ETS, also affect China's pilots. China's pilot system. I mean, yeah. Um, so so I, I, guess, we, I, I guess I guess that the point is there. Basically, you looked at this difference inside of the EU. Yeah. So is there something something similar being done for China? But Rafael, you can also simply step in if you want. I think we have yeah, that's, that, thanks, thanks, uh, Yeah, thanks, Malte. That's the idea. Uh, you mentioned the. Uh, the impacts across uh, EU countries, but uh, I was wondering if there are any impacts across uh, China's provinces mm. under the oh. different pilot systems. I'm not sure. Also, an interesting aspect which we unfortunately did not look into. <laughs> so we used uh, our aggregation only has uh, China as a whole, not disaggregated further. So but also interesting aspect, yeah. So we can do some follow-up work, I guess, on this. Okay, so Walter, your co-author also wants to comment on this uh, question of carbon taxes versus carbon trading, Sonia. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just thinking that, I mean, of course, it, uh, what would be the scenario with a linked tax? I guess it would be a harmonized tax. And then, of course, if you assume it's the same tax as in our full linking scenario of EU and China, then you would have the same amount of emission reductions, but you wouldn't have the selling and buying enough allowances. And that would mean that China is less well off because it gets less revenue because in the old scenario, it gets not only the revenue from its own, uh, it gets also the revenue from selling some allowances, but it doesn't get now. And the EU is, um, is, uh, uh, um, is better off. Um, because it has to uh, abate less, um, but um, that really depends on the question, uh, like on your scenario to which you actually compare them. Of course, it's also efficient, but it ha doesn't have this transfer of um, of um, um, of payments. Yes, and it also requires somebody who knows where the market clearing price for carbon is, right? <laughs> which is also not easy to find. Um, okay, so thanks everybody for the questions, Malte, for this great presentation. Uh, so that were great insights basically in the workings of ETS and what happens if they combine them based on the two papers. Um, so we are now moving away to the second block basically, which, uh, looks more on what does climate change mean for the economies, I would say, if you want to put some topic on this. Yeah. So we have uh, the first paper by Henry Chen, um, Scenarios for Assessing Climate-Related Financial Risk. And this is co-authored with Eric Landry and John, Re John Riley and um, Henry D. Lossius. So, hello everyone. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Not yet. So, can everyone see the slides now? Let me see, okay. Okay, so welcome to the presentation. So in this study, uh, we are going to ask what is the potential loss of asset values due to climate policies? So in other words, what is uh, the stranded assets when climate policies are in place? Uh, 
So the tool we are using uh, for this study is a computable general equilibrium CGE model. And the main feature of the model is that uh, it is uh, a global CGE model, which uses uh, the GTAP database. And we aggregate the GTAP database into 18 regions. And it is a multi-sector multi model. And uh, at the same time, uh, besides the uh, sectoral detail from the GTAP database, we also have backstock technologies uh, from the engineering data from IEA and EIA. And the model also has GHG emission details from uh, different sources. It is a recursive dynamic model uh, solved at a five-year time step. And for the purpose of this study, the model itself up to 2014. And the model also has capital stock details. And the capital stock uh, is divided into malleable capital and vintage capital. Malleable capital can move freely between sectors, while vintage capital will become sector specific. The scenarios we consider for this study include no policy, Paris forever, global action post Paris, and deep cut uh, post 2017. For the no policy scenario, uh, there are no explicit climate policies. And for the Paris forever scenario, the national determined contributions will be met through power and transportation sector policy and measures. If policy and measures alone are not enough to meet the NDCs, GHG's emissions will be priced. And in this Paris Forever scenario, beyond 2030, the policies will remain at 2030 levels. The next scenario we consider is global action post Paris. And this, in this scenario, up to 2030, uh, the policy assumptions are similar to Paris, or Paris forever. And beyond 2030, besides policy and measures of Paris forever, global cap and trade on GHGs will be in place to keep the warming no more than two degrees uh, Celsius. The last scenario we are considering is deep cuts post-2017. In this scenario, warming target is the same as the previous one. Negative emissions options will be available from 2017 onward. And because of this consideration, 2030 to 2070 emission cuts can be relaxed. Note that in our study, we only run the model up to 2014. So the 2070 uh, timeframe is actually considered in a separate study. And here we just borrow the emission path from that study. So the stranded assets we are considering in this study include uh, stranded value and stranded capital. The stranded value we refer to uh, are uh, the loss of rents from fossil fuel resources. For example, lower prices of uh, gasoline, more uh, fuel left in the ground. And in this calculation, we include stranded equipment in the extraction sectors, such as drilling rigs, while our, which are inputs to refined oil sector. And for stranded capital, 
we consider lower returns to capital in fossil fuel consumption sectors. And in this study, our focus is only on the coal power plants, uh, the stranded capital of coal power plants, because coal fire generation will be most affected by climate policies. So to calculate the stranded value, what we are considering is the difference between the fossil fuel value under the no policy case and the fossil fuel value under the policy case. And if we sum, sum up the discounted uh, the stranded value over time, then we can have the present value of the stranded uh, fossil fuel asset. For the stranded capital, what we are considering is the difference between uh, the no policy case uh, strength uh, is the difference between um, the value of uh, capital under the no policy case and the value of capital under the policy case. And similarly, if we sum up the discounted value, we get the present value. So here are uh, some results for primary energy use. And uh, the main findings are uh, the introduction of emissions mitigation uh, can temporarily interrupt the growth trend in overall energy demand if it is aggressive enough, as we can see from global action post Paris scenario. And under the current national determined contributions, primary energy increase through 2030 due to population growth and rising living standards still can be observed. And under the more aggressive scenario, like global action post Paris, fossil energy decrease uh, will be most and fossil fuel uh, and the non-fossil fuel increase uh, will be more significant. So for the power generation, some observations include, first, the existence of non-fossil fuel electric power generation uh, will make the power sector more resilient to climate policies as shown in the increased share of non-fossil non fuel generation. And while outputs from oil generation and coal fire generation decrease, uh, that isn't the case for gas power generation, not just because the footprint of gas power generation is lower, but also because the economy will rely more on intermittent generation source like wind and wind and solar. And in this case, gas fire power, which can be ramped up immediately, will become an important source of uh, power generation, even under climate policies. Another observation is coal fired power under a more aggressive scenario will decrease more, and this will have implication on the stranded capital, which will be explained later. So here are results for stranded values of fossil fuels. And here we can see that uh, if we compare different scenarios, Global action post Paris, which is the most aggressive one, um, will have highest level of stranded values. And while regional results are not presented here, what we found in our study is that in terms of stranded value for uh, crude oil production, Middle East will have the highest amount of 
uh, stranded values for that. And the US, on the other hand, will have highest stranded values for uh, natural gas. And China will have the highest value of uh, stranded value for coal. So here is the stranded capital result for coal power generation. And again, if we compare uh, scenarios, we will see that the results for Paris Forever and Deep Cuts post-2017 are almost the same. The reason is that with the presence of negative carbon emission technology, uh, in the deep cuts post-2070 scenario, we don't need to cut emissions uh, significantly before 2040. And because of that, the stranded capital is essentially the same as Paris Forever, or even slightly lower. But in the global action post-Paris scenario, the stranded assets will be the highest because immediate action will be needed to cut emissions. And uh, near-term emission cuts will require more uh, phase out of coal-fired power generation. And because of that, the uh, stranded capital of coal power generation will be higher. And if we look at the re regional results, which are not explain uh, which are not presented here, China will have the highest level of stranded capital of coal power generation. So in this study, we use an economy-wide CGE model with capital stock details to estimate stranded assets. In the future, individual firms, financial institutions can combine our analysis with their asset portfolios details to determine their climate-related transition risk exposure. For future research directions, uh, we can consider use uh, the metrics presented in this study uh, to bridge the gap between climate scenarios and credit loan assessments. We can also consider analyze the issue based on a forward-looking framework and we can consider both transition and physical risks together using an integrated assessment model where uh, the earth system component is also included. So thanks everyone uh, for uh, participating in this presentation. Any questions? I see there is one question in the chat and, and Dominic has also raised his hand. So maybe we can start from Dominic and, and then read the question from Malte. Thanks, Maxim. Uh, it's a really nice work, uh, Henry. We did a similar study for uh, the World Bank and that, there are a couple of reports that were published last year. Our, our numbers are a little bit higher. We, we The total was 22 trillion, but we did expand uh, to looking at the energy intensive sectors as well and, and the, the losses, uh, uh, potential losses there. We also went out to 2050 and then probably our, 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 the stringency of our simulations are probably a little bit different, but the orders of magnitude are very, very similar. I had a technical question. It, 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 with your, 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 um, your fixed capital, I was wondering whether you don't get problems with quarter solutions where the, the rate of return doesn't want to go negative in some of these sectors that are, are hard hit. So um, we consider uh, the vintage capital in our model. And uh, what we get is that if we need to shut down coal-fired power plant, for example, then the return to capital uh, can be zero. Yeah, but we didn't get a negative return here, so uh, can you elaborate the situation where you get negative return? Uh, you you probably have some mixed complementarity condition in there, I presume. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, thanks, Dominique and Henry, for this uh, important points, basically. And now um, Malte has a con more content-related question. Huh? So, what is why are there these stranded value for gas if you see this huge shift in elect in electricity generation from gas in your scenario? So how does this fit together? So um, we didn't present regional results here, but you are right. We uh, also, as I mentioned before, we observe uh, the highest stranded value for gas in the US. And the reason is because uh, with uh, climate policies in place, especially a more aggressive climate policy to reach the two degrees warming target, we still need to even cut gas, although gas is uh, the source of fossil fuel with lowest carbon footprint. While I mentioned that in power sector, we may observe, you know, uh, the gas power is quite resilient to climate policies. Uh, in other sectors, while gas can be uh, reduced, while there is opportunity for uh, reducing gas input, uh, our results shows that uh, we still need to cut uh, gas a lot to uh, meet the emission target. That's the source of uh, the stranded value for gas. Can can I ask something? I mean, it's basically both to Dominique and Henry. I mean, I, I'm I'm naturally struggling with in the CGE when you try basically to say something about. If you focus on losses in one sector, basically, and you have full capital mobility, yeah, so that capital goes somewhere else and generates income. So basically, that should focus on this vintage capital, yeah. And then actually, the question if this is hit or not depends basically on the physical depreciation versus the stringency of the climate change policy. Is this right? So let's say if you would have 10% depreciation per year, but the climate change policy only requires you to cut by 5%, basically, then I don't see that there is something like lost returns because this difference in the capital will be invested somewhere else. So how do you interpret this kind of stranded values if, if basically physical depreciation is not that large. Henry, that's a question for you, and perhaps Dominic can then comment on this. So, uh, the stranded value here, actually, it comes not from uh, the existence of depreciation, it's more from the fact that uh, part of the capital uh, is not mobile in our consideration while we try to represent the real world. So uh, the point here is that, uh, for example, in power sector, uh, capital mobility is quite limited. Because of that, if we, would like to, if we need to meet some emission targets, we uh, would need to shut down coal-fired power plant immaturity. And because of that, uh, the return to uh, the capital in coal-fired power plant will be zero. And compared with a no policy scenario, there is a loss, um, loss of uh, capital return due to the presence of capital, uh, of, due to the presence of climate policy. And this is the source of uh, stranded capital here. Uh, we consider. I uh, hope I answer the question properly. Dominic, before I turn to Mike's question, perhaps a comment on this? Sorry, you unmuted, you, you muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, we, we basically have the same setup uh, between malleable and, and, uh, and, and vintage capital. So, uh, yeah, it's going it, to, so, it, it will depend on the stringency, but uh, obviously, you know, if you're looking, for example, at the power sector, uh, uh, 
even with relatively low stringency, you're still going to see a substitution away from the dirtiest sources of energy, right? So the coal sector will still decline more than, than the gas powered sector. Uh, and uh, yeah, the depreciation will obviously take, you know, will, will reduce the reduction if you want to some extent, but, but in most cases you still see uh, a, a, net, uh, a net reduction in value in the coal power sector. Okay, thanks. Then Mike, um, so Mike says, glad to see this extension. And then he asked, did you try to measure the boom in capital values in the clean energy sources? And do you know what the scale of basically this additional income in clean energies is compared to the stranded capital value in the dirty sectors? So uh, that's a great, great question. We didn't do uh, the comparison, but that is something we can look at in the future. So uh, in this uh, study, at the current phase, we only look at the decrease return uh, to the capital in coal power sector uh, as uh, stranded capital. But I think uh, you are right. At the same time, you will also see an increase in the capital in uh, the cleaner uh, generation options. Okay. Um, perhaps you, you allow me another question. You mentioned that you're working together with engineers to better capture basically technical progress also in something like coal power plants. And then you stressed basically this importance of of gas, yeah, as a, a flexible power source to deal with the stochastic fluctuation of renewables. Um, have you tried to consider possibility to store energy in to some degree in the future because you are looking at the long run? So. So in this version of the model. Uh, what we consider is a gas fire backup uh, to uh, cope with uh, the intermittency issue of renewables, including wind and solar. But I think it's a good point to also consider other backup options like battery or even combining some hydropower. Although hydropower as a backup might be more site specific. In this study, uh, we haven't considered both. Uh, what I'm trying to say is battery backup and hydro. I think that could be a, a good uh, extension for the future. Okay. Further questions to Henry? No, then um, I think pretty sure in the name of the of all who are with us in the sessions, thanks to Henry. Yeah. So other viewpoint on this question, how climate change policy impacts the the economy. I think that is this is quite important. Yeah, similar to trade. Yeah, the distribution of losses and wins of those policies, which in the end also determine to a large extent the the policies as decided upon. Yeah? If you don't understand who loses or wins, it is pretty hard to come up with plausible policy scenarios. So I think there's a huge step forward to uh, inform us on those consequences, which helps also then to write better storylines for our scenarios, yeah? to get more insights on how this policy works. Now, um, it's a pleasure now to turn to paper number four. And I guess you are all probably as curious I am about what Dominic is going to present because he had put the tension up with the paper he uploaded on the conference website. So um, we, will, we will see now the, how you can turn your CGE into an integrated assessment model. So I guess many of us are keen to uh, learn how you do this. And uh, so now the floor is yours, Dominic. Enlight us. 
Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, can you see my slides? Um, not yet. Uh, I think, Henry, can you please stop sharing your screen? Um, you should have a button stop sharing on the bottom of the screen. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Let me. All right. Shall I try again? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we are still. Yeah, now I think you should try. Oh, yeah, we can see. Them. OK, good. Um, let me go to full screen mode. All right, I, I, I may have oversold the paper, but we'll see. Uh, so, uh, I, I will be looking at two legs uh, of turning a CGE into an IAM. So I'll be looking at uh, one of them is on the process emissions. This is new work that Max and I have started. And the second is uh, a new climate. Uh, I'll be talking about a new climate model, simple climate model that can be easily uh, merged into a CGE model. So let me start with the with the with the process emissions. So um, the GTAB has been uh, uh, providing the CO two emissions for 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 quite a while now, and we have uh, also been providing some of the other uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, we did not have what are called CO two process emissions in the database. Uh, but it turns out that uh, these account for roughly one third of total emissions when measured in uh, CO2 equivalent. There have been a number of studies that have shown as well that there that there are lower cost abatement possibilities uh, 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 outside of uh, fossil fuel combustion. I think uh, the European Union and its EU Green Deal is looking at some of these alternative policies rather than just uh, relying on taxing uh, combustion uh, emissions. At the same time, measuring and monitoring may be more difficult. Uh, you know, a lot of this coming from from cattle, uh, other crop production, and things like that. So, uh, it's a lot. I think it, it it raises some some implementation issues, which I'm not going to delve into at all. I'm just I'm just raising that as as a possible issue. So, as I said, we've been collecting uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, we have uh, uh, the other greenhouse gases, so methane. Coming from rice, livestock, and uh, waste management are, are three of the big big sectors there. Nitrous oxide, mostly from from crop production, and then a bundle of fluorinated gases um, that that come from 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 industrial processes, notably electronics. So um, we've recently added uh, CO two process emissions. So uh, a, a lot of this comes, for example, from cement manufacturing. So cement does combust a lot of fuel, but there are chemical processes that occur in the manufacturing cement that also lead to CO2 emissions. The other thing we did is that uh, we already have the, the, green, the other greenhouse gases. Most of them are processed emissions, but um, we, we divided them, segmented them between those that are linked to combustion of fossil fuels and those that are, are purely uh, processed emissions. So here's um, here's what the current database shows for for uh, for one aggregation of the database. Uh, so we I, I, it's ten regions, uh, reading from left to right: China, USA, OPEC, Europe, the uh, rest of the world, which mostly Sub-Saharan Africa, I think, South Asia, rest of OECD, rest of East Asia, Russia, and rest of LAC. All right, and you'll uh, the 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 kind of the the darker uh, shaded um, uh, rectangles are combustion emissions. Uh, and obviously most of those are CO2. There are small amounts of N2O and uh, methane as well from combustion, but, but mostly it's just uh, 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 CO2. And then the lighter shade uh, are the process emissions. So if you focus on China, for example, you can see that there, there's a fairly large amount of uh, uh, CO2 process emissions, um, that's the orange color, and then uh, methane, again, is, is pretty important, okay? You see that in OPEC as well, uh, the methane emissions. I think a lot of that is just fugitive emissions coming from, from uh, fossil fuel extraction and the production of, uh, of refined oil. All right, so that, that, that gives you a flavor of what we're talking about. And, and, and again, uh, let me repeat that the, 
the lighter shade area is about one third of, of total uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you drill down um, simply on the process emissions, um, so this comes from the, the full, fully disaggregated the GTAP database, this is at the global level, uh, the largest source is, is from uh, livestock, yeah? Uh, so, uh, so fair amount from nitrous oxide, but most, most of it is methane. The other, uh, maybe surprising, but actually not, is from water, and this is water services, so this is mainly coming from uh, 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 sanitation services provided mostly by governments. Uh, so that's just, just uh, human waste being treated and it releases a lot of, uh, a lot of methane. Um, then you, you can see uh, as well the, the large carbon uh, dioxide emissions uh, in non-metallic minerals, that's essentially cement, uh, but also in the chemical sectors and non-ferrous metals, and then um, in, in some of the fossil fuel sectors. And the only other thing I would like to uh, highlight here is the, um, the fluorinated gases essentially coming from chemical production and, uh, and uh, electronic equipment, all right? And a little bit in non-ferrous metals. So what's the modeling strategy? Uh, let me just get uh, straight to this picture because uh, uh, this, this is the way it has been done traditionally and the way we've implemented and envisage. Basically, we've created this greenhouse gas bundle and it, it includes all the process emissions. So for those of you familiar with the, 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 the emissions database that we, uh, that we issue, we have selective drivers for, for all the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So some are linked to uh, the capital stock. So that would be herd size in the case of livestock. Some of it could be linked to uh, land, for example, nitrous oxides are normally linked to land, methane in rice production. Um, uh, we also have some linked to, uh, to uh, output and the others, of course, linked to intermediate demand. We, in this case, we're ignoring all those drivers and we just collapse everything. We aggregate everything into one greenhouse gas bundle. So we, 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 we sum up all the greenhouse gas process emissions, and that creates one bundle of greenhouse gas emissions, all right? And we, 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 uh, there's substitution between that greenhouse gas bundle and the standard output of, of any sector, all right? And there's a substitution elasticity between the greenhouse gas bundle and, uh, and output. Um, and uh, uh, the what happens is when you start taxing or putting a price on 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 uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that price of that greenhouse gas bundle rises, and you substitute away from emissions towards using more inputs. Okay, now these are calibrated to uh, what are called marginal abatement cost curves. These are provided by um, uh, by by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agencies. Okay, and uh, 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 that's, that's how the process happens. We have secondary nests there that breaks out that greenhouse gas bundle into the different uh, emission types of so carbon dioxide, methane, and basically it's the ANTF structure there. So there's, we, we assume kind of a virtually perfect complementarity uh, across the gases at that point. So uh, I did some very illustrative uh, uh, simulations uh, for the sake of this talk. We, we, we're in the process of, you know, we, we've, we have integrated and envisaging, we're in the process of uh, looking at the calibration of, 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 the, of the MAC curves, uh, and we'll, we'll have uh, the fuller results using the envisage model uh, uh, shortly. But here, this, these are just illustrative. Uh, so we're using Envisage, it's a compared static version, and we calibrated to the 10A power, and we just did, you know, some, some greenhouse gas shocks from 5 to 25% in increments of, of 5, all right? So uh, we assume uh, perfect uh, when and where. Uh, so these are, uh, these are global taxes. All right, um, so the, the, the orange line is when you're just taxing combustion uh, emissions and the tax uh, for 5% is, uh, is around 15, it goes up to uh, 
$150 uh, for a 25% cut in emissions. And no surprise, when you, when you add the process emissions, where you're also taxing process emissions, the tax drops pretty significantly, all right? This is pretty standard. If you look at, at uh, uh, the, the EMF exercise on the non-CO2 emissions, I, I think it was EMF 21, uh, the results are, are, are pretty similar. If you look at the impacts uh, on the cut in, um, in emissions, all right, so we got here on the left panel combustion emissions and on the right, the process emissions, you'll see that uh, for the 25% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions, you would have to cut pr uh, combustion emissions by over 36%. All right, there's a little bit of complementarity with process emissions. Um, so they get, in that case, they get cut, but only by 2%. All right, so not, uh, remember that in, in the, with the orange bars, the process emissions are not taxed at all. All right, now when you tax all emissions, you can see there's a rotation uh, a, a away from uh, purely relying on the combustion emissions. So they, Instead of declining by by over thir around thirty six percent, they they decline by twenty nine percent. Then you see a pretty large rise then in the uh, in the reductions in process emissions at over sixteen percent. And the welfare impacts are pretty consistent uh, with with the carbon tax. So uh, if you look at the twenty five percent cut scenario, uh, the global welfare impact drops from from over 3% to under 2.5%. Roughly 25% cut in, um, in, uh, in the welfare impacts, again, pretty consistent with the, with the EMF exercise. So in terms of next steps, as I said, we're, we're, we're reviewing the calibration of the, the MAC curves and their implementation and envisage. Um, We'd like, uh, once, once that's done, we'd like to do a much deeper dive kind of in the impacts, both looking at, at how it affects uh, uh, the, uh, the different sectors and regions. Uh, when you include the process emissions, we're also particularly interested in kind of the, the agricultural side of this, so, because a lot of the process emissions are, uh, are in agriculture. So how does it impact land use and, and food security? Um, eventually, we're going to want to add to all of this the 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 the, uh, the land use change uh, uh, emissions. So this is changing from forestry to uh, pasture and or crop. Um, uh, we have added to the database uh, the emissions coming from land use changes. So for those of you. You have access to the database. You you will have access to those emissions as well. We, we are not yet uh, modeling those, but that that's kind of the long term aim. So that's the end of part one. So that again, that that's uh, mainly focus on on this new database and how to implement it in uh, in a in a GTAP style model. So let me get to part two, which is how to. Uh, integrate a simple climate model uh, into uh, a CGE model. So there's been a very long tradition of these simple climate models. Nordhaus's first model dates from 1979. So he was quite uh, prescient because uh, in 1979, not too many people were, were focusing much on climate change. So um, uh, uh, that's, that's quite impressive. So um, that, they, the, the, there are various versions of dice and rice all in GAM, so that it's pretty easy to just extract the climate model from, from the dice or rice models and just put that into a CG model. For those of you using GAMs, uh, these three models, dice, page, and fund, were used for, for the uh, famous uh, report uh, by, uh, by the US government on the social cost of carbon. Um, so page, uh, which code in Excel also had a pretty simple climate model and then fund, uh, by toll and Antoff, uh, likewise had, had one. I believe fund is now coded in C sharp, uh, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure about that. That's why I put a, a question mark on that. Uh, 
uh, Merge, another GAMS-based model, has also has uh, a climate model in it. It's a little bit more sophisticated than the ones in, uh, in the DICE model because it's, it's dealing with some of the other gases. DICE is purely CO2, uh, whereas Merge had, had some of the other greenhouse gases. I had used the Merge version in some earlier versions of Envisage. There's a relatively new model called Hector, um, written in C++. I looked at it. It's uh, it's pretty complicated. I mean, it is a simple climate model compared to uh, the large uh, Earth system models, but it's it's a pretty complex piece of software. Uh, you can use that as a standalone, or or uh, it has been incorporated in GCAM, which is similarly coded in C++. Many of you, I think, are using Magic, which is a standalone, uh, standalone simple model, and so you just you just link the emissions from your own CG model as you use that as an input to Magic. Magic then outputs uh, the um, the uh, temperature signal, and you can iterate a few times to get the two models to uh, to get the, the exact same results. What I'm going to be talking about mostly today is about a, a new model called Fair. Um, which is available uh, online. It's, uh, it's written in Python. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, and I have converted that to to GAM. So I, I that's what I'll be talking about uh, the rest of this talk. Um, so what what is a simple climate model? Well, there are three components. Um, there's the carbon cycle. So the inputs of the carbon cycle are your emissions. And the carbon cycle, I, I'm using carbon cycle generically because it, it, it also includes the other gases, but uh, a lot of the focus on, uh, on, on carbon dioxide. And basically carbon cycle is how, how the emissions into the atmosphere then get distributed uh, across the different components of, 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 of an Earth system model. I'll, I'll be a bit more explicit about that in a little bit. The second component is forcing. So how does the, the change in the atmospheric chemistry impact uh, radiative forcing? And that, that eventually gets converted into a, a, a temperature change. And that's called the, the energy balance part of the, of the model. So uh, the carbon cycle, um, basically the planet gets segmented into boxes or pools. So DICE has three boxes. Uh, the atmosphere and the upper and lower strata. I believe the upper and lower strata uh, 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 refers to the oceans. So the kind of the, the uh, shallow part of the ocean and the deep ocean. Uh, Hector has eight boxes. So it's got the atmosphere. It's got three different pools for, uh, for land, vegetation, detritus, and soils, and then four for oceans. Uh, FAIR has four boxes. Um, uh, which are uh, the ge geological processes, deep ocean, biosphere, and mixed ocean. So what happens is that the emissions from the economy, uh, they, they, in all of these models, the emissions go into the atmosphere, but eventually uh, the atmosphere, they, their fluxes between the atmosphere and these other boxes. And that's, that's what really uh, is, is the, uh, the carbon cycle. DICE is a very kind of simple and straightforward transition matrix approach. So X percent of atmospheric emissions flow into the shallow oceans, none flow into the deep ocean, but the shallow ocean has fluxes between the atmosphere yeah. and the deep ocean. So the FAIR model uses uh, what's called an impulse response uh, model. It's basically a, a reduced form. So the, 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 even though behind uh, the FAIR model, there's a, there's a complicated set of fluxes, uh, in essence, it's, it's just uh, a reduced form where the change in, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, composition of the chemicals in, in any of the pools is equal to some share of uh, contemporary emissions, um, uh, less, less decay, all right? So there, there's a decay in each of these pools, um, and it's that tau parameter is the key to the decay. And what, what's kind of novel in the, in the FAIR approach, I think, is, that, uh, is this alpha parameter where the decay actually is, is a state variable. It, it really depends on the, the, the state of the pools. Whereas in 
most of the other carbon uh, cycle models up until now, all the per parameters are basically fixed um, uh, and do not depend on, on the state of the pool themselves. You could think of the, the, the you know, the, the more carbon there is in the atmosphere, uh, uh, it's going to change the, the absorptive capacity or the decay rate, if you want, uh, in, in the atmosphere. I'm not going to go through all the physics of this, but basically this, the, the, the important part here is the second equation um, where you can see this, this key parameter, uh, the, the, uh, the IRF 100 depends on the state of the pools uh, in any given time. So you have cumulative emissions here. Uh, so it depends on, on basically on, on, on the cumulative emissions. It depends on the atmospheric temperature. So the decay rate depends on, on how, how hot uh, the atmosphere is, All right? So, um, so these are, these are the, the equations uh, uh, in discrete form uh, for, for the carbon cycle, uh, very easy to implement uh, in, in GAN. And um, uh, I can, uh, obviously we'll be, we'll be sharing, sharing the code with you. Um, but this is, it's, it's, um, it's in some ways similar to DICE. The, the really important aspect here is that this alpha parameter changes the the, uh, the rate of change uh, uh, of these fluxes across the different different pools. Um, the forcing equations um, are are pretty standard. Uh, almost all the models uh, have been using this. So um, uh, the the forcing depends on on the concentration uh, relative to the pre-industrial level of concentration. All right, and there are three functional forms. So one uses logarithmic, uh, one is just a, a simple linear uh, function, and, and one uses a, a quadratic function. In most cases, for most uh, forcings, only one of these coefficients is, is positive. All right, in some cases, uh, they've actually estimated uh, uh, positive coefficients uh, for for uh, two or more of them. So. In the case of carbon dioxide, for example, both both F1 and F3 uh, are positive. In the case of uh, FAIR, in the case of of, um, of the DICE model, only F1 is positive. So that will be one difference between DICE and FAIR, uh, as well is is just these these forcing equations. Another interesting fact about FAIR is that it has a lot more forcings than uh, than emissions. Uh, but each forcing is linked uh, to emissions. So in the case of methane, for example, uh, there are three forcings linked to methane. One is a direct impact, just a change in the uh, chemistry uh, of the atmosphere, but there's also impacts on the ozone layer and stratospheric water that have independent uh, impacts on radiated forcing. Finally, uh, the energy balance model can be written pretty simple, pretty simply in, in matrix format, uh, because most of these energy balance models, like the carbon cycle, are linked to, to boxes or pools, uh, thermal boxes in this case. In DICE, there are only two thermal boxes, the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, the FARA model has three boxes, so it splits the, the oceans, both shallow and, and deep layers. Uh, they they argue in their paper that this this proves uh, to more accurately track uh, uh, the large uh, Earth system models. All right, so the the motion equation is just um, uh, uh, this this uh, ma in, in matrix format. So you got some of these key parameters here uh, that link uh, the energy. Uh, the energy fluxes across the uh, the three different uh, three different boxes. So dice can be written in this format as well. And the only the only thing about dice is that the cap of three uh, is equal to zero because there are only two boxes in, in the case case in the dice model. But I've coded it, uh, it to be exactly the same. So in the end, it becomes a parameterization issue and not really a difference in uh, in the specification. Unlike the the carbon. 
Uh, the carbon cycle is a, a very different specification. Here, here the specification is the same, but it's just the parameterization that's different. There, in kind of implementing this, uh, there are other issues. So the, the Python code is pretty straightforward. They have annual time step. It starts in 1765 or something like that. So you don't have to worry about initial conditions at all because it starts so far in the past. But uh, when you link this to a CG model or, or, or DICE, you do have to think about what the starting conditions are. Uh, I, I've been using the fair values for 2014 as my, 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 my starting point. Um, the FAIR model does use an impulse response implementation of the EBM. I, I detail this in the paper, you don't have to worry about it, but uh, I've tested it. it doesn't make any difference whether you use the IR implementation or the standard EBM. Uh, and then I do discuss in the paper as well, how to deal with a uh, variable or multi-year time step. Um, so I just one illustrative simulation uh, I, I'm doing just uh, so I implement it into DICE. I, I use the uh, the latest publicly available version uh, that uh, uh, Nordhaus published uh, with an MBR paper in 2016. So I'm able to replicate in the MBR exactly, but then I introduce some minor changes, uh, uh, just different initializations essentially, and I I I. I because of the five-year time step in, in DICE, I also uh, using averages uh, over two two endpoints uh, to to smooth uh, to smooth the shocks. Um, then then I I, I decompose uh, if you want the the differences uh, when I replace various components of the uh, climate model with the fair climate model. So I start with I replace the carbon cycle. Then the radiated forcing. There, I'm only focused on the carbon dioxide component of that, and then uh, uh, the the uh, energy balance model. So I think this is uh, close to my last slide. Um, so these um, here, I'm. There are a lot of results. So I'm, I'm just showing you how it impacts uh, uh, Nordhaus's optimal uh, optimal scenario. So he's got. He's essentially working with three scenarios. So there's there's kind of a, a, a baseline um, with uh, with no damages, a baseline with damages, but no no uh, no climate control. And then the optimal is one where you you have the optimal uh, climate control. All right, and that provides you kind of the optimal temperature uh, coming from that. All right, so die zero is the original from the NBR. You can see that it tracks dice one almost perfectly except for that the, the the very initial periods because I, I did change the initial conditions um, so dice one for me is the new reference All right so when you implement fair's uh, carbon cycle you can see that the optimal temperature at the end drops from roughly 3.7 3.8 degrees to under 3.4 degrees all right when you implement fair's uh, uh, forcing uh, uh, parameterization that leads to a small uptick in the op optimal temperature it goes to to around 3.5 3.55 but then when you when you implement the uh, the the new parameterization of the energy balance model the, the uh, optimal temperature drops pretty significantly to around three degrees D now all of you know that uh, are aware that this has been Pretty controversial in in the literature. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Part me on the way uh, uh, Nordhaus has uh, parameterized the carbon cycle and we could, uh, the climate model, and we can see here that it does make a difference. But the, but the larger issues I think really relate to uh, uh, the um, the discounting uh, mechanism that that Dice uses and and. Uh, uh, I, I'm not having a discussion on that here. All I'm showing here is that the parameterization of the climate model does does matter a lot. So um, in terms of next steps, so I do have the GAMS version of FAIR uh, and I, I replicate exactly uh, the Python version. I have been uh, interacting very closely with the, uh, with, the with the developers of the, the FAIR model. I, I have implemented it in, in Envisage and I'm testing it right now. Um, it's uh, 
DICE uses a five-year time step, and I tested using uh, uh, both the, the, the single-year variant and the five-year variant of the EBM. The, the, te the, the tests are, are identical. Uh, again, this is something that I describe uh, in the paper. Um, they, we may want to split the F gases uh, a little bit further. It just was an issue that was raised earlier this week when I when I presented this to the GTAB advisory board. And uh, those who are interested can just bounce me an email and I will share the code with you. That's it. Oh, the paper will uh, get to the third uh, element, which is the impacts. But uh, uh, certainly, given the time constraints I had here, I wasn't going to discuss much about impacts. But when the paper is done, I will I will talk a lot about the impact as well. Thanks, uh, Wolfgang. Okay, thanks, Dominique. Um, we have about ten minutes or so left for this for the session until the a lot of time is over. Um, so, as this is rather comprehensive and basically consists of two parts, the first one is basically this question, how you model a, abatement in the CGE and this process emissions, and the second is about something quite different, which is a basically a reduced form of a climate model. I would say basically we start with five minutes on the first topic and see if in the meantime questions drop in on this reduced climate model. So there are already um, at least two questions here with relate to how you deal with this process emissions. So um, Malta was asking about which sectors actually which have this process emissions offer also abatement options, so to say, where you have abatement curves integrated. And the second question linked to this by Mike, Bur Mike Byrne is, um, okay, this abatement curves they, are, they can look pretty nonlinear and you have saturation points and so on. So it looks that you try to catch this with the usual CES representation. So um, how good is this actually working? Um, so far, it's working. Uh, it's working well. We haven't had any issues. I mean, uh, and maybe 25% cut in emission global emissions is probably not uh, probably not going to be sufficient. So I mean, if we go to kind of a net zero emissions, uh, we may we may have other issues. Um, we are thinking about looking as well at uh, alternative functional forms. So maybe something like a, a, a logistic function with uh, asymptotic behavior. Uh, might might be uh, another thing that uh, we we should be considering, but uh, we we haven't evolved our thought yet to that to that point. Okay, and then uh, Malta's question basically: Do you have this abatement curves for all the uh, the activities in the GTAP database which are linked to process emissions? Uh, I might let Maxim answer that. I, I think for most of them, I think for cement, we don't because the EPA uh, database is only dealing with the uh, with the other greenhouse gases, whereas uh, in cement, for example, it's CO2. So I don't think they have CO2 based uh, uh, MAC curve. Is that right, Maxim? Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we have uh, MAC curves for all non CO2 greenhouse gases. But we don't have so far markers for the industrial process CO2 emissions, like yeah, cement and some other chemical products. So that's something we need to add. But for let's say agriculture and non-CO2 mitigation, it's relatively detailed based on EPA data. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, further question on this from the audience? Then, then I like then. There, then there's a question from Henry, uh, but I think uh, Maxim again would best be uh, uh, able to provide an answer to that. Um, yeah, so yeah. this is the question I will maybe read it. So the, for fossil fuel emissions, they can be allocated to different sectors based on fossil fuel consumption levels. And Henry is asking, just, just wonder how processed emissions are allocated to different sectors. Uh, for instance, by output level or others, and also do you try to consider feedback from climate results to economic modeling? 
Uh, so in, in terms of the like linking of emissions, we uh, the approach we use uh, we rely on the Edgar database, which provides emissions uh, for of, of both industrial process CO2 emissions and non CO2 greenhouse gas emissions by different drivers um, and 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 the PCC sector classifications essentially and yeah um, and fuels as well. So we we map this to the GTAP sectors and and fuels uh of course in some cases we need to make assumptions for instance we use their to in some cases to reallocate, reallocate emissions we use uh, um, um combustion rates or uh, well emission factors you have to better map them between different sectors but in general the edgar database provides a, a relatively good level of detail so that we can Relocate emissions to different sectors, and we also complement it with FAO data for for some agricultural emissions where needed. Um, and then, in terms of the feedback for climate results to economic modeling, I, I think this is a third part that Dominic was referring to. I don't know if, if he can comment on it. So so far, we have not yet implemented it in, in this uh, context, but this is the next step. Thanks, yeah. Maxim. And th thanks, Dominic. Then, um, perhaps related to this uh, question of, of the data, I mean, are those MEC, MEC curves different across the GTAP regions? Yeah, so the MAC curves, they are country and sector specific. Okay, thanks. So there are different kind of like abatement opportunities and, and indeed there might be relevant to have an asymptote sector and country specific. Because in many cases of the non CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, the abatement opportunities are relatively low. So, I mean, it could be like by 20, 25%, not more. So it's really hard to even like at a higher price level, like $1,500, you can't cut more than let's say uh, 10, 15, 20% emissions from livestock, for instance. Yeah, so you, you need other options. So, and, and EPA data captures this. So, we also need to reflect it in the model. Okay. Um, are there questions to that second part, the representation basically of this climate models from the audience? Okay, then, then I have a, a question which has to do with the linkage. If I understand the current way, basically, you link this, this abatement, basically, with the model, it looks that the composition of the climate relevant gases in the bundle is constant if you abate. Is this correct? That's correct, yeah. But it looks as if you have different as with this new version of the model, basically, you have the saturation effects of this forcings, which are different by gas. So, uh, so, so I wonder basically ab about, about how important that is. And if we should try basically to also consider that the abatement options, they reduce different gases differently. I've, I've worked a lot on, uh, abatements on dairy farms. So I know basically that this is, this is not something which linearly cuts the emissions. Yeah. So you, the, the emission portfolio changes when you abate. Um, you would still get that, uh, because each sector has different, uh, a different composition of, uh, greenhouse gases. Correct. No, but what I'm saying is if you. If you abate emissions from dairy farming, yeah, yeah, basically the, the gases you reduce in the first five percent overall CO two emissions are different ones than you get from the next five, and so on. So we, so I mean, we 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 do have that second CES nest. So mostly the, I I'm relying on the parameterization from the OECD. So they had okay. they had very low substitution elasticities there. Uh, but, uh, they, they are sector specific, so we could raise that secondary level of substitution. Basically. Okay. Good. Um, further questions from the audience. Is okay. there one more question in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
There is some... not an explicit elasticity. Uh, so the question is, in the greenhouse gas bundle, is there elasticity between CO2 from combustion and non-CO2 emissions? Uh, and there, there, uh, there is none explicit because the, the CO2 combustion is, is from coming from combustion is going to be part of the other inputs. So it's it's kind of indirectly with that top level mess, there'll be some substitution elasticity there. Uh, but it, it's there, there's kind of not a direct link. Okay, okay. then um, I would say we. We close the discussion of this last paper with this. I would like to thank all presenters again. Yeah, you were sticking to time, and I think you shared quite interesting insights in this climate change policy modelings and also modelling impacts of climate change. Um, and I think we have learned all from this and got ideas for our own research work. Um, for me, it seems that all the paper underlined there is need for increased cooperation across disciplines because we are moving closer to the real biophysical world with all what we are doing or the engineering world. Yeah, so I I would raise our attention to this to this point. Yeah, um, that as we move into this details, we need to better understand the processes we are trying to model there. Yeah, so this question around which we just had about the abatement curves gives a very good example. I think also Henry's work with how fast uh, is actually physical capital in power plants this depreciated and what does this mean if you abate is, an, is another example for this Jewish paper was talking about the power sector in Hong Kong. So you see this already in the papers that, that people take le deeper looks there beyond the structure of the model to better capture what we are doing. So um, I think that is perhaps one last comment from my side. So I'm seeing now forward after this great session to further one. I would also thank all attendants for the interesting questions you have raised during the, during the sessions. So thanks for attending and let's enjoy the rest of this great GTAP conference.